and gentlemen. As salutatorian of the graduating class of 2004, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Mr. Eric Burnett, history and English teacher, informal counselor, and comrade. Originally from San Jose, California, and a proud father of two, Mr. Burnett shares a relationship with us that is truly unique. Our class progressed through the grades, but uncannily, so did he, albeit in somewhat reverse order, spending two years in the eighth grade, two in the third, and now teaching in the high school. Fortunately for us, he was there when we needed him the most, whether to tolerate our hormone-ridden prima donna ways or to allay our past afflictions of senioritis before the wearing of our caps and gowns tonight. Parents, please do not fret, for all of us will be pronounced cured in just a matter of moments. Now, Mr. Burnett even claims that it was our class that gave him the courage to take on the high school two years ago, referring to us as his younger brothers and sisters. In the words of one of our graduating seniors, Ms. Clarissa Cavajairo, Mr. Burnett's generosity, kindness, and honesty have made it easy for our class to grow close to him after all these years. On this note, please join me in welcoming Mr. Eric Burnett. Good evening, Mr. Gross, Mrs. DeFord, members of the board, distinguished faculty, proud parents, honored guests, and almost alumni. Thirteen years ago, your parents walked in the classroom of a kindergarten with teachers and held your hand. You were nervous, you were excited, and then they met your teacher, they gave you a hug, and they waved goodbye. Since that time, these school days have passed in a blink for your parents, but for you, they've been painfully slow. Now that day, you probably shared something all in common. There were tears shed. That day, tears were shed because your parents left you. Today, there might be tears shed because you are the ones doing the leaving. I was asked a question a few months back by one of your classmates, a young lady who has a fondness for horses. And she came to me after meeting with her sixth grade science teacher, Mrs. Hill. And Mrs. Hill had said this would be the one class she would definitely attend a graduation for. This is the class she wanted to say goodbye to. And she came to me and she asked, Mr. Burnett, what is it about us that teachers just like us so much? And I fought the urge to say, wow, what a pretentious question. And, um, and to be honest, at the time, I don't know what my answer was, but since that time, I've had a chance to think about a possible answer to this. And I think what her true question was is, why are we unique? And the truth is, there is no one group of you. Yes, there is a group of you that is hyper-competitive, that has created this culture of competition that is permeated throughout your classroom. Yes, there's a group of you that, is, that are athletes, that have dominated IASIS time and again. There's a group of you that are artists, that have excelled both in the studio and on stage. There's a group of you who have lived on three hours of sleep because you studied throughout the night. There's another group of you that's lived on three hours of sleep for entirely different reasons. Um, now, though you are so different, you do in fact have a few consistencies. For one, you started asking questions at the age of 18 that many of us waited until we were in our 30s to start asking. And over, at some point over the past few years, and maybe even in the past couple months, you've asked yourself, wait a second, I've jumped through the hoops, I've done everything asked of me by my peers, my parents, my teachers, my counselors, the college admission gods, I've done everything, and yet there's something that's missing. And you're not sure what that is. Now some of you at this point might have just shut down. Others of you might have waited and played the game hoping that, wait a second, the next step has to be different. Now a rather spunky thespian that I taught last year in psychology, he asked me a question, he said, Mr. Burnett, why is it it seems adults are always trying to get us to put off our happiness today for some future? It seems like in fifth grade they were telling me about the stresses of sixth grade and changing classes, and in eighth grade, why well, better watch out for those high school teachers, and high school I was preparing for college, and college I'm preparing for my job, and then when I get my job I can prepare for, well, I can prepare for my, parent, my children's graduation money, and then paying for college, and I can prepare for retirement, and I can prepare for the future again. And he asked me, he said, why is it that it seems adults are always telling us to put our, our happiness until a time when we're going to be too old to appreciate it? And I thought, I kind of smiled at him and thought, wow, you, it's kind of a question that we all should ask ourselves, and yet we're all afraid to ask that because to answer it makes us wonder why we prioritize our lives the way we do. Now let's get back to the girl's original question. It actually was, why do teachers like us so much? Now I can't speak for my fellow colleagues 
in fact, there's a few that kind of scare me still. But <laughs> I can speak for myself. I will miss you for one reason. You are an extremely likable class. Now I know likable will not score me a six in the category word choice in the hollowed six traits writing rubric. But what I do know is that that's what you are, likable. When I first taught you five years ago, I felt I had dropped into teaching utopia. Here I was with this class that no matter what project I'd give to you, you would attack it with such creativity and effort that what returned to me surpassed my expectations every time. And yet the whole time, we had fun. You laughed at each other, you laughed with me, you laughed at me, lifeguard. And, um, and the truth is, every day was enjoyable. And then I left to hang out with the munchkins for a little bit. And when I returned, there was new faces. But these new faces were equally endearing, equally driven, and equally witty. And you made work fun. Now at this point, I'm treading precariously close to the land of chicken soup for the soul. So I'm going to move on. Um, another reason why I like you so much is that you're extremely easy to manipulate. Now, <laughs> no, no, please. Um, manipulation has a negative connotation, but in mind molders such as ourselves, it's an incredible teaching skill. See, what we could do is we could just throw out a task, and amazingly, you would jump all over yourselves and try to achieve it. And along the way, you were able to push yourself to levels you never would have achieved if not for that lovely little thing called peer pressure. Now, from here, success is going to be a little bit more difficult to define. To this point, you jump through hoop A, and you receive reward B. But it gets a little fuzzier from here on out. So tonight, I'm here to set forth a series of challenges. Whether or not you follow these is entirely your choice, but now here's where the manipulation part comes in. But understand that those of you who don't, you're 87% less likely to be successful and happy than the person next to you who chooses to. <laughs> um, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to let the challenges begin. First of all, I'd like to challenge you to take advantage of the fact that you are starting new. This might be the only time in your life where you're able to change your geographic location at the precise time you have unprecedented independence. Now the famed mathematician Joseph Lingle once said, <laughs> The moment you leave high school, you never have to ask to go to the bathroom again. Now, please understand that adulthood is so much more than toilet independence. In addition, as an adult, you get to choose your personality. Many of you have come to me with the concern that, wait a second, I, I want to change, I want to try a new activity, but I feel like my reputation or expectations put on me don't allow me to do that. Well, the moment you step onto a college campus, all that changes. The only person who prevents you from being the you that you want to be is you. Yep. Next, I challenge you to recognize that the people you'll meet will not have your international perspective. And how could they? When I was in third grade, we did a powerful unit on my neighborhood. I learned about where the fireman was. Um, I also, we took a walk to the library. Now this was followed by the next year I did a lesson on California history. The year after that, we did a lovely unit on American history. We then returned to something I could really relate to, those Aztecs and uh, those uh, Egyptians. And then fortunately, I spent the last six years moving between American history, American government, American civics, and what should I do when I become an American citizen. Um, so you can't really fault them for their lack of perspective. So you need to fight the urge when they ask you one of these lovely questions in college to ruffle the little hair and say, oh, you cute little provincial American. You're just adorable. You've got to, you have to fight this urge, and instead you have to answer their questions patiently explain that no, in fact, I had a roof that actually was made of stone and not in, of thatch. And you need to inspire them to look the, beyond the world and realize that there is actually something beyond the US border. Next, I challenge you to avoid passively accepting the Cliff Notes version of the world. Many of you have survived in an age where information is merely a Google.com entry away. Unfortunately, the summarized version of life oftentimes leaves out crucial details. You know, the CNN soundbite or that little paragraph summary on encyclopedia.com, it'll get you by for the night before you have to turn in an assignment, but it leaves out the ability for you to make a judgment on your own. When you choose your news, think of this. Realize that the quantity of color pictures is oftentimes inversely correlated to the quality of discourse. So when you know that there are two sides to every story, hopefully you'll be able to make a better choice.